let you go and we'll call the... Now, with the agreements between the committee earlier on, we're going to incorporate the Australian Rail Track Corporation and also the Inland Rail uh, and Rail Policy Division. Yep. If that doesn't make them happy rather than appearing at 11 o'clock at night, I don't know what will. Sure, mate. Yes, we've we'll agreed to put them both together. It's just easier. No, not from us, but I think Senator O'Sullivan will have a little bit on the table. Yeah. If I get back on time, I'll have something on it. Yeah. Well, we've got the smoke break at 3.45. I think we'll still be going up till then. OK. Um, if he gets back on the inland rail. Yeah. <coughs> Now, who's our running sheet? Because I've got my glasses on. I know Mr. Fullerton. So. <clears throat> Mr. Fullerton and Mr. Smith. Thank you, thank you. All right, now, um, on behalf of the Chair, we'll welcome representatives from the Australian Rail Track Corporation and the Inland Rail Division. Uh, and I don't think you want any opening statements, so we'll go straight to questions. Senator Williams. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, folks, for being here. Um, in relation to <coughs> the business case for why the Inland Rail needs to acquire greenfield sites, particularly along the stretch between Narromine and Narrabri. Why is that the case, that it's got to have a greenfield site? Well, uh, the key... The key sorry, yeah, sorry, Mr Fullerton, sorry. I'm just got to give you a name, rank and serial oh, number. Yeah, John Fullerton, Chief Executive Officer, Australian Rail Track Corporation. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks, Mr Fullerton. The... Uh, the 2015 program business case was quite specific in terms of the, the requirements that Inland Rail needed to meet in relation to the market. Uh, around about 70% of the revenues that are generated by Inland Rail will be intercapital freight from Melbourne yeah. to Brisbane. And currently, um, on the east coast of Australia, we only have a market share of probably less than 25%. And that's because uh, it cannot compete with road. It's a, a longer route. It's about eight or nine hours longer than the uh, road. Therefore, you know, it was pretty important from an inland rail point of view that you build this track to be able to achieve a market share shift from road onto rail. OK. And is, that, is that the reason you're not using more of the existing rail line, for example, a Canamble line? Well, I mean, for the Melbourne to Brisbane route, which is 1,700 kilometres, we're using about 60% of the existing rail corridor. But of course, uh, there are some greenfield sections around about 600 kilometres in total, 300-odd uh, kilometres in New South Wales, which is the narrow mine to narrow bry section, where we really had no alternative but to uh, build that as straight as we can, again, to achieve that service offering. And also in Queensland, uh, a large section between the border and Gowrie, again, with greenfields to achieve that service offering objective, which is less than 24 hour transit time. Okay, Mr Fullerton, we lived through this, through this on our farm in South Australia when the Indian Pacific line was built, went straight through our farm. Let's just go some questions farmers would be asking. You'll pay full price for the land you resume, no doubt? Yes, there is a process that we go through for to value the land. Okay. Who values the land? Uh, the landowner themselves can seek their own valuer and, uh, and we pay for that. And then okay. it's part of the, the negotiation with that landowner. What happens if the value says, well, it's $2,000 an acre and the landowner thinks it's $3,000 3, an acre? Who's going to uh, settle that dispute? Look, you know, we like to think that, you know, all those land acquisitions will be achieved uh, through negotiation. But there is, you know, there, are, there is mechanisms to, to deal with that if we can't reach agreement. But we expect and we hope that uh, all those land acquisitions can be resolved uh, between us and the landowner. OK. So you've got to come to agreement with the landowners? You cut a paddock, 80% of the paddock on one side, 20% on the other. There's no water in that 20% because the paddock's been cut. Do you pay for the infrastructure to put water into that 20%, the leftover piece? Well, part of the valuation will look at how some parts of the land will be degraded for that reason. It can't be either usefully used as agricultural land. And we, there could no, no, be no, 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 let me yeah. paint that picture clearer. Yeah. <coughs> There's a thousand acres in a paddock. Well, yeah. mm. You cut it off. You take your stretch of land for our line, you've left 100 acres in one corner, 850 the other corner. There's no water in the 100 acres. That's still a 
pretty handy piece of land if it's good soil, 100 acres. What happens with, with the water infrastructure if, they've, if they've, they've got to run the water infrastructure to the other side of the railway line? Well, they're, they're the, exactly the sort of thing that we can talk to individual landowners, how we, do, we can provide water mm -hmm. if that land is retained for agricultural purposes, or we will look at how we can provide stock crossings, machinery. All those things will be taken into account when we look at that final corridor. Bearing in mind we'll try and avoid where we can uh, severing paddocks, but eventually that will have to be the case. But you know, we want to make sure that the, the land that we take is kept to a minimum and what's left over for use by the farmer is, uh, is maintained in a viable way. Which well, on a greenfield site, severing paddocks would be part of the project. It would be, but I mean, on that, we, we tried to follow either property boundaries or fencing lines or uh, all those types of things to try and minim minimise it without compromising the need to make it as oh, flat and straight as we can. OK, bit. the fencing. Who fences it? In greenfields, uh, we will pay for the capital cost of the fencing and the ongoing maintenance. And the ongoing yes. maintenance. Greenfields. That's greenfields. The greenfields. Something that's not a farm now. Is that right? Sorry? So you do the ongoing maintenance. So basically... It's greenfields. Something that's not a farm. You will now. do all of the negotiations with the landholder, what you pay for the land, the landholder can get it valued, you'll pay for the valuation, you'll pay for the fencing, you'll pay for the upkeep of the fencing, you'll pay for the water infrastructure, and so on. Is that how I'm reading it? That's right. I mean, every case will have a different set of circumstances, but of course it will. You know, our objective is to make sure that we have minimal impact on landowners along those greenfields corridors to keep as much of their land uh, available for their use. At the same time, you're going to have to have the line the straight as you can as well. You're not going to go bending around each property around their boundaries. No, we can We cannot. The train driver we, will get giddy. No, we cannot zigzag. It needs to be flat and straight. That's right. So therefore, I think you're going to be cutting a lot of paddocks and a lot of properties. Mm -hmm. Going on what I've seen in South Australia when they built the Indian Pacific. Mm. I can't see any way out of that. The boundaries, you know, if you fluke to get alongside a boundary, that'd be just a fluke. 95% I think will be going through paddocks. And so the message out there to the farmers is negotiation talk about the prices, the compensation, fencing, water infrastructure, the number of crossings required on a property to get machinery and livestock across, all of that. All of those things will be taken into account with every individual landowner. And last question, if the farmer thinks they're hard done by, who do they go to appeal their argument if they can't come to an agreement with ARTC? Well, I mean, there are limit mechanisms. I mean, we don't think it will get to that stage. With, uh, that's not the question. Whether you think or not, you can bet there'll be some blues. There always there are. There could be some blues, and the, and the landowner, if we can't negotiate with the landowner, they may choose not to uh, do the deal with us on a voluntary basis. But there are mechanisms under the New South Wales legislation that deals with these problems uh, when they occur. But we, we, but we do think we'll be able to negotiate satisfactory arrangements with every landowner. If you can't, and it comes to a blue, then you're going to use a big fist, is that right? Well, they'll have mechanisms under the New South Wales Act legislation. Which would be the big fist. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Senator Williams. Oh, could you stick around? Because I've got some questions on this too. So yeah, go for it. One thing about Senator Williams and us, uh, we've worked on this in the best interest of Australia's food production industry, there's no doubt, so I might need your hand here too. Because I want to talk about the narrow mine and narrow bright section while we're on to it, Mr. Baldwin. Sure. So uh, you had said that the impact on landholders was a deciding factor in the selection of the route, which we've just talked about, and you've nominated a preferred route which slices through 300 farm businesses rather than choosing an upgrade to an existing line. That's correct, 300? There's about just under 300 uh, landowners affected. Just under 300, yep. OK. So at any time did the RAC go to the government and present them with a specific option of adding time to the journey in exchange for minimising impact on farm businesses, particularly between those two towns that I mentioned? No, no the, uh, the, the service offering which uh, was developed with customers who will use the railway line uh, specified a clear service offering. It had to be less than 24 hours. It had to be able to operate double stacked long trains. Right. It had to achieve certain levels of uh, reliability and uh, that was taken into account when we looked at what could we achieve in terms of market shift from road on to rail. So that service offering is quite fundamental to guarantee the success of the railway line. No, that answers that answers yeah. that very clearly. But but it also underpins the economic return which then allows you to compensate these people for, for that economic return. Well, uh, well absolutely. I mean I think so, the, so, uh, so the it's under not 
going to be, you know, you do have some leeway here. You've got the most efficient route, double stacked, straightest route, and what you've got to do is keep the people happy that it's going through. We're very mindful that, we, that every landowner that we, we uh, need to build the railway line through, that we work with them on how we pay for their land and how we compensate them for any detrimental impacts on the operation of their properties. But Mr Fuller, is it true that the government backed the 24-hour target? No, it was backed by industry. Uh, oh, so the government didn't back it? The industry just well, said... It was back, well, indus we, in, back in 2014, when we commenced the pre-construction phase, there was an industry reference group that was established and that, that involved freight forwarders, rail operators, the industry as a whole, and what was their requirements to incentivise them to shift from road onto rail. No, I understand and that. that. A, yeah, I understand yeah. that. Look, Senator Gallagher and I have dealt with the freight forwarders for many, many years. OK, we understand okay, our productivity is foremost in their mind. We get that. So the industry came out and said it must be less than 24 hours, and that went to government. Did, the, did you, the ARTC, actually sit there with the government and say, Minister, maybe we have to put into consideration the uh, concerns around the th just under 300 landowners, where 24 hours is an easy statement to make that the industry want, but it might not be what the farming community uh, uh, would agree to. Did you do that? Did ARTC say, hang on, Minister, there could be unforeseen circumstances we need to talk about? Well, no, I think ARTC's position was quite strong on the need for that service offering. We've got a lot of experience in operating intercapital freight markets. Uh, you know, Sydney to Perth has got 80% market share. It's competitive with, with road. We know that if you're not competitive with road on transit time, you will not enjoy the market shift. Therefore, you will then erode the business case. So our position around that service offering was quite strong that we needed to achieve that less than 24 hours to be competitive with road, otherwise there's no incentive for people to ship. No, no, OK, I've got you. You joined at the hip on the 24-hour with the industry, the stakeholders and all that, R rather than, yeah, OK. Uh, so again, in May, in May of this year, you referred to the quick, specific regional benefits. That's the case? To that the, is the case, you did? Yeah. To the regional benefits, yes. And uh, you've advised the national farmers no, not the National Farmers, the New South Wales Farmers Association, that you've not undertaken any socio-economic analysis of the proposed corridor between Narrow Mine and Narrow Bry. Is that correct? I think that refers to a, a, a question whether we'd undertaken a business case for particular alignments between Narrow Mine and Narrow Bry. And the answer to that question is no, we didn't undertake specific business cases for each of those uh, corridors that we assessed as part of that corridor determination. Okay. We used a, a separate process involving uh, multi-criteria analysis that looks at uh, a whole range of factors to determine the best route. Okay, so I'll just say so from, from an, an ARTC document given to the New South Wales farmers, you talked about the socio-economic cost and benefit analysis are not undertaken as part of the concept assessments for infrastructure projects, that's correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, we assessed it on okay. construction cost, uh, service offering and the multi-criteria multi analysis. So could you tell the community how does this square with your assertion that there are quite specific benefits despite the admission that this work has actually not been undertaken at all? Well, because we've used a standard, well-accepted process to assess corridor alignments based on the criteria that I've just outlined. Cost, yeah. Which is looking at the cost, construction cost, which is looking at the service offering that will go to how much revenue we can generate from that line because of market shift. And we looked at a, I think eight factors that form part of the multi-criteria assessment involving social uh, economic factors as well as technical factors around constructability, technical standards. And that, that process is undertaken by uh, engineers, expert in the field, to determine the preferred alignments. And each alignment that was uh, uh, reviewed was considered on those, on those same consistent factors. OK, so question out of left field. Um, what is the projected time of the journey on the inlet from, from Melbourne to Brisbane. What, what is it? If it gets going the way that you plan. Less than 24 hours. No, no, oh, look, one hour is less than 24, Mr. Fullerton. Coming from a trucking background, when minutes count, especially when you're filling out a logbook. So, 
on average, what would be the time of the journey that is, is predicted if the stars and the planets and everything line up? Uh, we've modelled for what we call premium intermodal trains. They can run under, just under 24 hours. Just under? Just under 24 hours. Okie dokie. And uh, bearing in mind that uh, most freight is consolidated during the day and leaves at night, but don't worry about that. If we had to go and we did the right thing and we sat down with the just under 300 families and took into their concerns, is there any modelling to suggest that uh, the the uh, trip would take much more than 24? Or is it just the industry said 24, this fits 24, go away? Well, I mean, a lot of the corridors that we looked at between Narrowmind and Narrowbry looked at impact on transit time, and some of those added, you know, 12 minutes in one particular case, 15 and another 20 minutes, as well as impacting on construction costs. So those sure. times were considered to be material and a material impact on the business case that would affect the economic case. So, okay, now help me out just so I haven't got this wrong. So am I to assume if we consulted the 300, just under 300 farming families that will be impacted with this uh, new rail line, that we could add somewhere between 12 and 24 minutes to a full journey between Melbourne and yeah, Brisbane? Depending on what corridor, and you know, between Narrow Mine and Narrow Bry, you know, from the time we looked at that corridor alignment back in 2010, there's something in the order of 20 or 30 different options were considered uh, on that greenfield section. Uh, and they all looked at the time penalty uh, attached to them as well as construction costs and other factors as part of the, uh, the MCA where we conducted those. So, you know, I think we, we took the view that any time saving was beneficial to the business case <coughs> the rate, under the corridor. And, and, and Senator, if I could, uh, you're referring to a number of just under 300 landowners. Uh, that's the number that are affected by the two kilometre wide study area between Narrow Mine and Narrow Rye. But as we narrow that down, and we're in the process of narrowing that down to uh, a narrower corridor, ultimately we'll get to 60 metres wide, is where we'll build the railway. It's going to be a far lower number than the, than the 300 that will be impacted by that final alignment. So I shouldn't get focused on the difference of a... How far is Brisbane to Melbourne? Brisbane. By rail. On so Brisbane to Melbourne. On the new, is 1,710 kilometres. So I shouldn't get sideline focused on what the difference 24 minutes would make over the entire journey, should I? Is that right? No, other than our view is that it's a significant impact on the ability to convert freight when you're not offering a road competitive service. So given that the government has an agenda of being a pro-regional growth, why has research not been undertaken to determine whether this $10 billion investment of taxpayers' funds can assist in regional development, rather than, as appears to be the case between Narrow Mine and Narrow Bry, cut towns out of the opportunity to directly benefit the rail as it passes through them? Once well, again, 24 I mean, hours? <clears throat> I think the alignment that was chosen uh, which we call the Western Alignment, looked at building a new intercapital freight network that bisected some of the richest farming areas so that they could take advantage of the benefit of an efficient rail spine that can deliver their produce to port. And that was a, a very clear part of the work that was done back in 2006 and also in part in, in 2010. So, will these, will, so, okay. So, does the train, sorry to come in, so, so I get it in my head. Does the train stop anywhere once it leaves Melbourne, or is it? Well, that would depend on the operator. I mean, for intercapital freight, the freight will go from Melbourne to Brisbane. Parks will be a key intermodal exchange point for freight that goes to the west. And I'm certain they'll be stopping trains, but some trains, express trains, will run straight through. Uh, for regional freight, you know, that freight's generated in the region, loaded onto existing sites and they could be on branch lines that will be connected to the inland rail spine and that, will be, that will provide a far more efficient and productive uh, corridor to the port whether so it's the 20, exporting it so the 20 sorry the 24 hour is the express is that's the uh, melbourne to brisbane express service but regional you know the benefit of inland rail for regional areas will be that it will connect with existing regional lines it will, it will enable freight tra trains to operate interoperable between those regional lines onto the inland rail spine for export to port that will substantially reduce the freight costs <coughs> to the producers. 
So, Mr. Fillington, the RTC regularly refers to the connectivity between the existing country regional network in New South Wales and the inland rail, which you've just talked about. So what commitment has been received from the New South Wales government that they will continue to maintain the branch line to Coonamble, which enables you to so confidently claim that this particular community has not been bypassed by the rail? Well, Senator, I'm encouraged by the uh, Fixing Country Rail program that New South Wales announced. They've uh, already announced $138 million, I think, of funding. Uh, Three, three areas in that funding uh, relate to regional lines, one being <coughs> extending a crossing loop at Mary Gowan, which is on the Dubbo to Ulan line. Uh, and there is a commitment to, and we're working very closely with New South Wales on how inland rail will connect with all those regional lines, including Canamble, including Dubbo, including uh, Narrabri into the port of Newcastle. So, so, so there is, there is Canamble's actually mentioned and Canamble, the money will be the there. Canamble to, to Gilgandra to Dubbo line will be connected <coughs> to inland rail. Okay, so can you tell me how the ARTC uh, can make a recommendation to government about a preferred corridor without undertaking any investigation of whether passing the line through or close to a community may improve the region's socio-economic sit uh, situation. For example, the recommendation to build the line through 300 farm businesses instead. Well, Senator, that goes back to my earlier point that we needed to build this line as flat and straight as we can utilise as much of the existing corridor that we can, but still achieve that service offering of less than 24. That's what we've, we're doing. But importantly, that building that line through those regions will connect with existing regional lines that, are, that service some of the silos and terminals that will allow those trains to be loaded on those regional lines to run and connect with inland rail corridor for operation of the ports. Okay, so the, AT the ARTC has advised the New South Wales Farmers Association that the surface offering of the inland rail requires, amongst other things, a journey of no more than 24 hours between Brisbane and Brisbane, which we get, and Melbourne and Brisbane. The RTC has also advised that this figure was arrived at in consultation with freight forwarding companies, which you've said. So, has the ARTC undertaken any modelling or consultation with freight forwarders about the impact of a journey between Melbourne and Brisbane, which takes up 25 hours. The industry, when we consulted with that reference group back in 2015, were pretty clear on what they required it to be, and that was less than 24 hours. Okay, so they've locked in and they've virtually said, I cannot put words in your mouth, I wouldn't dare. So they've virtually said any more than, tw no, you, you said up to 24, but now it's less than 24. Not even interested. Even if you came back with, look, we can appease a heck of a lot of farming uh, families along the route, but it may take an extra hour. They don't want to talk about it. That's correct? Well, they, met, they looked at their, from their industry point of view, and, and as I said, Senator, we've got a great case model between Sydney to Perth, Melbourne to Perth, where rail is road competitive in time, and we have 80% market share. So they were very clear that to build a competitive railway to handle interstate freight, it had to be road competitive, and for it to be road competitive, it had to be less than 24 hours. OK, but very clear. They've yanked the chain there. That's been the freight forwarders. Just remind me who they were again. Well, you've got all the rail operators. You've got companies like, well, Woolworths, Coles. You've got Lynn mm. Fox. You've got Tolls. You've got uh, SC, uh, SCT. Uh, KNS, SCT, Cube, Genesee in Wyoming. You've got all the... They were all the players that were involved in that reference group, and they made their position very clear, and we, in which we agree with. Thank you, Doug. So, noting that no research has been undertaken into the socio-economic benefits of railway construction in the narrow mine to Narrabri corridor, and that you did not provide, nor were you asked for advice about mitigating the impact of the corridor on farm businesses, and your admission and analysis of the impact of a few additional minutes has not been modelled, what reason is there for farmers in the wider impacted community to trust anything that you have to say? Well, Senator, I think uh, the benefits of inland rail being able to capture those volumes on rail uh, demonstrates the economic case for the project, but inland rail will, will provide significant benefit to regional communities because we're offering uh, 25 tonne axle load at 80 k's an hour. It will reduce export costs for produce to the port. 
and it will connect with regional lines and road, and road, and roads for that matter to provide a far more efficient supply chain. Thanks, Mr. Fulton. So, so, so Mr. Fulton, oh, yeah. given the um, the distance between Brisbane and Melbourne is 1,781.8 kilometres via the Pacific Highway and the M31. <clears throat> Where's your 24 hours coming from? Because they can't literally drive a truck from Brisbane to Melbourne using the current um, road rules in 24 hours. The, the advice we've got that they I mean, can the do... the speed limit's to 100. They've got to go through towns, villages or whatever. Fatigue management, two operations, I mean, yeah, that's right. Are you, the 24 hours, I understand that. But are you saying that um, Brisbane, Melbourne, Fruit Market, the, the produce that's going up and down there is breaking the law and that's where you compete with? Because it's, right. it's nearly 1,800 kilometres. How is it possible for a B-double to leave Brisbane, obey the road rules, obey the law and get to... Mm. And get to Melbourne in 24 hours. And I know it does happen, but how is it possible to do that? So your business case is competing against what looks like a very fragile, um, dubious business model on the road. Well, Sam, I'm going back to what the industry has made very clear, that for them to convert freight, for them to invest in terminals and in, and in rolling stock and equipment, they need that service offering to be less than 24 hours. You're not going to deviate. <laughs> no, OK. All right. Now, Minister, can I just put a couple of questions to you, please? Knowing that you know how the RAT committee works. So, um, do you agree that there's been a failure by the agency to deliver for farmers and regional communities of Western New South Wales? No, I don't. OK. Uh, are you aware that on the 22nd of June in Gilgandra, the Deputy Prime Minister gave a commitment to the New South Wales Farmers Association that he would attend a community meeting to discuss the government's approach to inland rail? I'm not aware of that commitment, but I okay. assume if you're telling me that, Senator Stirl, that it occurred. Yep, OK. So, uh, at the same token, Minister, are you aware that the Deputy Prime Minister's office is still yet to fix a date for this meeting? despite the commitment being given more than four months ago, which I think I know the answer already. I just thought I'd highlight that to you. If you could, Minister, can we find out what is the delay? Absolutely. I'll, I'll take that up with the Deputy Prime Minister um, after we finish here. Thank you. And Minister, noting all that you've heard today, do you not believe it would be advisable to conduct a full independent inquiry into the data underpinning the selection of a route between <coughs> Narromine and Narrabri? and to find ways to minimise the impact on some of the most productive farm business, uh, sorry, farm businesses in the country? Well, Senator Stirl, I uh, am absolutely committed to the project of the Inland Rail and what it will deliver um, to regional communities right throughout um, its over 1,710 kilometre right. route. Um, so I'm confident it will deliver. Um, I'll take the specifics of your question on notice, given that I'm not the responsible minister. but. Um, I'm confident we're starting and we're going to get it rolled out as soon as possible. Thank you, Minister. Now, Chair, I have questions.